Good morning. I call this hearing to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I would like to begin by noting some important requirements. Let me begin by saying that standing house and committee rules and practice will continue to apply during hybrid proceedings. All members are reminded that they are expected to adhere to these standing rules, including the quorum. House regulations require members to be visible through a video connection throughout the proceeding, so please keep your cameras on. Also, please remember to remain muted until you are recognized to minimize background noise. If you have to participate in another proceeding, please exit this one and log back in later. In the event a member encounters technical issues that prevent them from being recognized for their questioning, I will move to the next available member of the same party, and I will recognize that member at the next appropriate time slot, provided they have returned to the proceeding. For those members and staff physically present in the committee room today, in accordance with the attending physician's most recent guidance, all members and staff who attend this hybrid hearing in person will be required to wear masks in the hearing room. Furthermore, all members and staff who have not been fully vaccinated must also maintain six foot social distancing from others. With that said, members will be allowed to briefly remove their masks if they have been recognized to speak. The COVID crisis dealt a severe blow to American workers. In 2020, the pandemic raised unemployment rates, halted wage growth, and lowered employee satisfaction with their jobs. This shock occurred as the labor force was already contending with rising income and wealth inequality and growing uncertainty surrounding retirement security. The Small Business Committee serves as the void of small firms in Washington. This includes the employees that help power these businesses as well as the entrepreneurs that start them. One such proven solution to alleviating the problems faced Facing these workers is through the employee-owned business model, which takes various forms, but has a uniting principle that the interests of the employees and owners are aligned. Today, I would like to focus on two of the most prominent types of employee-owned businesses, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, also known as ESOP, and cooperatives. ESOPs and cooperatives create a link between the fortune of employees and the performance of the companies they work for. As revenues and profits rise, employees are compensated, helping to create a culture of ownership in the enterprise. This model helps to raise wages, promote job preservation, and increase worker benefits. Employee-owned entities are also more resilient than their peers in the face of crisis. For example, a study by the Employee Ownership Fund Foundation found that during the COVID crisis, ESOP firms retain more jobs, maintain standard hours and salaries, and provide protective measures at higher rates than typical firms. Given the long list of benefits associated with employee-owned businesses, Congress must explore ways to facilitate and encourage the formation of these enterprises. Though employee-owned companies have become more prominent over the years, they continue to face unique obstacles. For example, co-ops have an especially hard time accessing capital through the SBA 7A loan program. They are locked out of the 7A due to the requirement of personal guarantee from anyone who owns 20% or greater share of a business. Congress took steps to address this issue by passing legislation I sponsored in 2018. The Main Street Employee Ownership Act sought to lower barriers to accessing capital and allow more employee-owned firms to participate in SBA programs. But unfortunately, the SBA failed to follow congressional intent and declined to propose alternatives for co-ops to secure a loan without a personal guarantee. 
That is why, as part of our committee's title of the Build Back Better Act, we provided $500 million in funding for a cooperative lending pilot within 7A without the requirement of a personal or entity guarantee. Today, I look forward to examining the potential impact of this cooperative lending pilot program and exploring other ways that Congress can help employee-owned businesses. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the benefits of employee ownership, the challenges these firms face, and what this committee can do to help. I now would like to yield to Ranking Member Mr. Luke Meyer for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to begin by addressing what is happening a few floors below us at the House Financial Services Committee this very morning. Financial Service Committee will be hearing from, of all people, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. And though I'm glad that Secretary Yellen has finally found her way to one of our House committees, I must address yet again that it has now been over 150 days since the Secretary has defied her legal duty to testify before our committee, the Small Business Committee, on COVID-19 relief for small businesses. Simply put, Secretary Yellen continues to break the law, and my colleagues on the other side refuse to hold her accountable. The Paycheck Protection Program has created, was created with two agencies spearheading the efforts, Department of Treasury and the Small Business Administration. With nearly $800 billion in assistance flowing through the program, it was one of the most important small business relief programs to assist and save the nation's smallest companies and their most important asset, their employees, in history. It is clear that while Secretary Yellen flouts her statutory responsibility to the program, she is also ignoring American small businesses. This blatant disregard for Main Street USA to be, appears to be a pattern within the Biden administration. Take, for example, the Biden tax hikes that are currently making their way through Congress without Republican input. Increases to the corporate tax rate, increases to the individual rates, and the increases to the capital gains rate will all crush our, our country's small businesses. While small businesses continue to recover from COVID-19, they're being impacted by supply chain issues, skyrocketing inflation, and a major labor shortage. And this administration's response to all these issues is to increase taxes. All the while, the Treasury Secretary continues to turn her back on our nation's smallest firms, which was, is her statutory duty, by the way. Madam Chair, last week I sent you a letter requesting that we subpoena her to testify. I look forward to working with you on next steps in order to conduct a hearing with the Treasury Secretary and the SBA Administrator as soon as possible. Now, today's hearing and topic are important. Employee-owned businesses are a viable option for many small businesses, especially with owners aging and planning next steps. However, I think it is necessary to also discuss some of the recent policy proposals put forth by my colleagues and how these proposals will impact small businesses' access to capital. Earlier in the month, this committee met to examine the small business provisions within the Democrats' partisan, reckless, socialist, and uh, spending spree. Not surprisingly, we saw numerous provisions that, that disregard responsible lending standards. Chief among these changes were language to create a direct lending option at SBA. This path that the Democrats are taking toward a one-lender model is extremely concerning. A few weeks prior to the creation of this direct lending tool, the Biden administration's SBA threatened lenders with audits if they didn't join with the newly created direct forgiveness portal. These are dangerous trends for many reasons. The existing public-private lending guarantee partnership harnesses the efficiencies of competition to deliver assistance to small businesses. As we all know, the federal government doesn't face competition. Importantly, private sector lenders also bring their own fraud protection oversight to the table. In fact, we have a case study right before us that examines SBA's direct lending model, the, injury, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which was activated at the onset of the pandemic, has underperformed compared to the private lender-driven PPP program. IDLE continues to be slow and cumbersome, and the SBA's lack of response and communication on loan questions has been frustrating and unacceptable. When it comes to fraud, report after report from the SBA's Inspector General and others have highlighted that the program is layered with massive amounts of potential fraudulent loan activity. And unfortunately, the fraud numbers continue to rise. It's important we note, to note that we, all, that we know all these problems are associated with direct lending. 
Yet my colleagues are continuing down this path. We also know the pitfalls of waiving the personal guarantee on loans moving forward. And this absolutely blows my mind. The SBA, in its own words, said of the personal guarantee, this requirement is to ensure that SBA adequately mitigates the risk to the loan program and ultimately to the taxpayer. And yet, they want to do away with it. My Republican colleagues and I will not sit quietly and allow more taxpayer dollars to be exposed to fraud, waste, and abuse through the SBA's programs. Underwriting standards should not and cannot be reduced. These are vital topics that this committee should examine thoroughly. I look forward to exploring many of these topics today with our witnesses. I came across uh, in a discussion yesterday with somebody and they made the comment that when entrepreneurship is strong, the next economy is on the way. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to grow this economy, we have to protect the small businesses, the entrepreneurs of this country to be able to grow our next economy. Madam Chair, thank you for the hearing and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Luke Meyer. The gentleman yields back. I would like to take a moment to explain how this hearing will proceed. Each witness will have five minutes to provide a statement, and each committee member will have five minutes for questions. Please ensure that your mic is on when you begin speaking and that you return to mute when finished. With that, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. R. L. Condra. Mr. Condra is the Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the National Cooperative Bank, a national financial institution dedicated to providing banking solutions for cooperatives and their members. He also serves on the Board of Cooperation Works, a national network of organizations focused on co-op development. Prior to joining the private sector, Ms. Con Mr. Condra worked as a Senate professional staffer. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Conrad. Our second witness is Ms. Tasha Cooper, uh, president of Home Care Associates of Pennsylvania, a worker-owned cooperative based in Philadelphia providing in-home respite and senior care. Home Core Associates got started in 1992 in partnership with another home care co-op based in the Bronx, New York, a testament to the power of co-ops helping each other start up and expand. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Ms. Cooper. Our third witness is Mr. Gary Sherman, the Chairman and Chief Development Officer of Eagle Communications, a 100% employee on ESOP based in Hayes, Kansas. Eagle Communications started the ESOP conversion process in 1998 and became majority owned by its employees in 2002. They have been 100% employee owned since 2012. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Sherman. The ranking member, Mr. Luca Maria, will now introduce our final witness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Frazier is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of Charlestown in Charlestown, West Virginia, and a leading official with the Independent Community Bankers of America, ICBA. Community banks have played a significant role in assisting and rescuing small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Beyond this emergency period, community banks, which are known for their focus on relationship banking, serve our nation's small businesses consistently day in and day out. Our vast country community in our across our vast country community banks provide access to capital and ca financial assistance to entrepreneurs and small businesses uh, as they strive to offer the best products and services to their customers. Their dedication to customer service and serving their communities honestly and responsibly cannot be matched. Ms. Fraser, welcome. Uh, welcome back to the committee. We thank you for joining us again to represent the nation's smallest banks. We're also grateful for you attending in person. Thank you very much. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Thank you for uh, all the witnesses for being here today. Mr. Condra, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Lickemeyer, and members of the committee. I had the honor of testifying on this issue last year and would like to thank the committee's continuing interest regarding the Small Business Administration's inability to provide cooperative businesses access to its lending programs. I would also like to thank the committee for its vision to create a cooperative pilot program that will provide much needed capital and build institutional knowledge of this business model within the agency. Is there anything more gratifying than becoming a small business owner? During the pandemic, haven't we learned how central grocery stores are to our communities? 
Unfortunately, the SBA, the federal agency that oversees small business assistance and growth, continues to block cooperative businesses and their tens of thousands of jobs from being created. To be clear, cooperative businesses should have the same opportunities, service, and financial products as other SBA borrowers. There are over 65,000 cooperatives in the U.S., and the top 100 generated $226 billion in annual revenue in 2020. Some notable cooperatives include REI, Ace Hardware, Ocean Spray, Linda Lakes, and Congressional Federal Credit Union. In the last decade, the number of worker cooperatives have doubled and have become a preferred business option for young people, women, minorities. According to the 2019 Worker Cooperative Economic Census, 50% of owners of worker co-ops are Latino and African American, and women make up 60% of the workforce. Additionally, over 160 food cooperatives have opened during this time, creating over 4,200 jobs. Last year, startup food cooperatives have opened in Colorado, Nebraska, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. All this progress has occurred without the SBA's assistance. The SBA has amended its outdated eligibility regulations to include cooperatives, but continues to block these businesses from accessing its programs with its own federal version of a Catch-22. Now technically eligible, co-op businesses must meet the agency's personal guarantee requirement, which states that any owner of 20% of the business must sign a personal guarantee for a loan. Due to its unique business structure, a co-op is just not able to meet the check-the-box personal guarantee requirement the SBA requires. For example, if a custodial worker cooperative in New York City is owned equally by 10 women, which owner of one-tenth of the business signs the personal guarantee? If a food cooperative has 5,000 member owners, which customer signs over their house to cover the other 4,999 customers? A cooperative borrower does have skin in the game. They raise money through member shares and member loans that should secure financial and equity obligations that lenders require. In 2018, Congress attempted to level the playing field for cooperatives by passing the Main Street Employee Ownership Act, championed by Chairwoman Velasquez and Senator Gillibrand. We were greatly disappointed to learn the SBA did not provide practical alternatives for loans as required by law. Essentially, the SBA ignored congressional direction and the needs of business owners and consumers. My employer, the National Cooperative Bank, has provided loans of more than $2 billion to cooperatives and independent retailers including over 77 million to food cooperatives. Per our loan policies, we do not require a personal guarantee for consumer and worker cooperative loans. Along with the private sector, there is federal precedent for not requiring personal guarantees to cooperatives. The Department of Agriculture does not require a personal guarantee for loans to cooperatives, but most startups are in urban areas. Ironically, even SBA does not require personal guarantees for loans to employ stock ownership plans known as ESOPs that have a similar structure as worker cooperatives. So why is there a need for a cooperative pilot program? The sector caught a break when Congress removed the personal guarantee requirement in the CARES Act for all idle and PPP business loans, thus giving cooperatives access to federal funding during the pandemic. Although this committee had to include specific bill language for cooperative businesses to become eligible for the COVID relief programs. Using the SBA reported numbers, the National Cooperative Business Association estimates that over 2,500 cooperatives received COVID relief loans totaling $1.2 billion in funding that saved over 93,000 jobs. Chairwoman Velasquez, let me personally thank you and the committee for helping these businesses and workers during one of the most difficult times of our country. Please be aware that the same co-op businesses that receive COVID relief funding are still not able to access the SBA's existing loan programs. Now, especially in black and brown communities, entrepreneurs are turning to the cooperative model as an opportunity to own a business or meet the grocery needs in their neighborhoods, many of which are food deserts. In 2015, Pastor Reginald Flynn of Flint, Michigan, wanted to start a food cooperative due to the grocery chain closures in his community. Pastor Flynn was unable to obtain financial support from the SBA. Six years later, he has raised $7.6 million and has, now has over 900 member owners. With the help of a $1.25 million grant from the state of Michigan, the food cooperative has finally started to break ground. Mr. This is Congress? a success. Mr. This Congress? is a six Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, time expired. And, Thank you. Uh, I, you could... Um, during the question and answer period, you could expand on Thank any you. issue that you feel that you feel that you haven't been able sure. to discuss. Uh, Ms. Cooper, you are now recognized for five minutes. 
Good morning, Chairman Velasquez, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and share Home Care Associates' story and discuss the need to address access to capital challenges for cooperative businesses. Home Care Associates of Philadelphia is a small business that is owned, controlled, and governed by its employees. HCA is the only home. HCA is, you know, Home Care Associates, and I'll refer to it as HCA throughout. ACA is the only healthcare cooperative in the state of Pennsylvania and is one of 500 cooperatives in the United States. Lack of access to capital, including small business administration loan guarantees is a central reason as to why so few of these businesses exist. ACA currently employs 124 full-time employees and 12 part-time employees. Although, although these past few years have been extremely difficult, we are looking forward to celebrating our 30th year in business in 2022. Around 1990, founders of a larger co-op, as, uh, as Chairwoman Velasquez pointed out, founders of a larger co-op in the Bronx, New York, set out to find money to replicate the model elsewhere in the United States. At the time, Philadelphia made sense because of its large population of elderly and disabled citizens in need of quality care, and because of the number of individuals living in poverty in need of a quality job. HCA's mission is to provide high quality home care services to those who are elderly, chronically ill, or living with disabilities, and to provide quality jobs where workers embrace opportunities to learn and grow as members of the healthcare team. They contribute greatly to the participatory, participatory culture and earn competitive wages and benefits while building a profitable worker owned company. The challenge to raise capital to start our business was enormous. Like many other cooperatives, cooperative small businesses, ACA was not eligible to receive startup support from the U.S. Small Business Administration. Fortunately, and thanks to others who believed in our model and mission, including charitable trust foundations and founders of the Paraprofessional Healthcare Institute, ACA was able to secure the capital needed to open its doors in 1992. However, I must mention that ACA was very fortunate in that there were other attempts to start other co-ops in cities that were not successful in raising capital. At our one year anniversary, ACA established two different classes of stock. Class A shares were held by our investors and class B shares were held by our workers. Worker owners would buy a share of the company for $500. Most of our owners do not have $500 of disposable income. So ACA lends the workers the $500 for the share at no interest. The share is then paid back with a $35 deposit and a payroll deduction of $3 per week. Upon making the deposit, each worker has one vote, can campaign for a seat on our board of directors, and is eligible to receive a financial share when the company is profitable. We are proud to share that all Class A shares were donated back to the workers, making ACA now 100% worker-owned. Raising startup capital, though, was just the first of many challenges we would face. 80% of the consumers that ACA serves are nursing home or Medicaid eligible, and most of HCA workers continue to be eligible for Medicaid. Unlike many non-cooperative businesses, businesses in the industry, HCA provides extensive training on both technical and soft skills we believe necessary to provide quality care. HCA relies on reimbursement from Medicare, Medicaid excuse me, to cover costs associated with training and employment. In our efforts to provide a quality job, HCA remains committed to applying 70% of its revenue to worker salaries and benefits. Although we remain true to this goal, many of our workers and families continue to live below federal poverty levels. Low reimbursements contributing to low wages translates to caregivers who are eligible for Medicaid. This reality is not unique to home care associates, home care cooperatives. PHI reports that one in every six home care workers in the United States lives in poverty. Since the onset of the global COVID-19 pandemic, our resources are quickly depleting. The expense of additional PPE to protect our workers and remain compliant fell squarely on the business. Fortunately, ACA did qualify for the first round of Paycheck Protection Program to support sustaining jobs and salaries, but did not qualify for round two because we could not include increased operational expenses that contributed to our increased losses. Although we have a strict PPE policies, many of our workers missed work, left work due to uh, lack of access to childcare, or because they or someone in their family became sick with COVID-19. 
The strain on our bottom line continues to be felt, and we continue to struggle now to hire new workers as overtime is increased and the expense related to that increases. Currently, ACA is struggling to find alternative sources of capital to support our efforts to sustain our business. Since early 2020, we have been uh, seeing a decrease in employees willing to purchase shares to become worker owners. We're struggling to find ways to pay a living wage without sacrificing training and benefits, and we lack the financial support needed to widen our scope of services. Ms. Like many in our industry, can, supply cannot meet the demand for service. Ms. If we are to increase volume so that we may remain self-sufficient and continue to provide quality care, we must secure the capital needed to expand our scope of service, pay a living wage, provide training, and increase Ms. Cooper, work to time has expired. Um, during the question and answer period, you will have time to uh, revisit any issue that you haven't discussed. Thank you so much. And now, Mr. Sherman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and members of the committee. Wish I could be there in, por in person. I'm Gary Sherman, Chairman of Eagle Communications. We're a 100% employee owned company doing business in Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, where we own and operate. 31 local radio stations in local and small communities. In addition, Eagle has creative, digital, and online learning divisions where we assist our local businesses. I'm also here representing the ESOP Association, a nationwide nonprofit representing over 3,000 ESOP companies and professionals. I'd like to state something right up front. ESOPs and employee ownership is not an experiment. They are proven, they are successful, and they're here to stay. It's time for the various agencies of the U.S. government, including the Small Business Administration, to recognize this and to treat ESOPs and employee-owned businesses as a successful, mature businesses that they are. According to the most recent figures submitted to the U.S. Department of Labor, approximately 8.6% of the entire U.S. workforce has some ownership in an ESOP. That's more than 14 million American households. In just a 10-year period of time, from 2008 to 2018, the Department of Labor reports that more than $1 trillion in retirement benefits have been paid to ESOP beneficiaries. Let me say that again, more than $1 trillion. In my written testimony, I've listed research showing the power of ESOPs, not only during the Great Recession, but also during the pandemic. ESOPs rebound much faster following economic downturns, and our company is a great example of that. Despite of all the strength, there remain far too many unnecessary obstacles for ESOP formation. To begin addressing those obstacles, Congress passed the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. I would like to speak to the two main goals of that legislation, access to capital through the Small Business Administration 7A lending program and a desperate need for awareness initiatives. During the pandemic, more than 70% of all ESOPs were successfully awarded Paycheck Protection Program loans through the SBA. That PPP program was administered through the SBA's 7A loan program and utilized the Delegated Lending Authority program such that local SBA lenders could approve these time-sensitive loans. However, in the first few days of the program, there was some initial confusion because despite the clear intent of Congress in the Main Street Act, the SBA does not allow loans to ESOP companies to be approved through Delegated Lending Authority, instead requiring ESOP loans to be approved by staff in Washington. Fortunately, clarification was quickly given and ESOP PPP loans were allowed to be evaluated and granted by local lenders, just like every other PPP loan, as Congress intended. We were one of those PPP beneficiaries, and it was a local familiarity that our lender had with our business that made it a streamlined and efficient process. Yet, even though our local lender clearly knows and understands our business and has evaluated and given us a PPP loan, if we were to apply for an SBA loan today, they could not approve it and would be required to forward our loan application to Washington where it might languish for weeks or even months. To address these issues, the SBA must streamline lending for ESOPs. It's as intended by the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. We ask that the SBA be unambiguously directed to include ESOP loans in the preferred lending program. The experience of PPP program clearly demonstrates that local SBA approved lenders are fully capable of evaluating responsibly and lending to companies like ours. In addition to lending the programs, the Main Street Act also sought to significantly increase awareness within the privately held business community about ESOPs. Within the act, the SBA was tasked with promoting awareness of ESOPs and employee ownership. 
Business owners must know the ESOP option exists and must be able to attain useful, unbiased information. And to that end, uh, be directed uh, to have a centralized and specific office, such as the Office of Small Business Development Centers, with active public education and information effort about ESOPs. Further, we ask that the SB undertake specific ESOP uh, relegated ed uh, educational training for regional SBA staff. We have been recently encouraged by public statements and support for employee ownership as articulated by SBA Administrator Guzman. As you know, one of the biggest economic challenges ahead is the looming retirement of baby boomers who own nearly 2.5 million businesses. It's known as a silver tsunami, and this will be the largest transfer of business ownership over the shortest period of time in our nation's history. Many of those businesses have no succession plan. So time is of the awareness to raise uh, all of the important issues regarding ESOPs for business owners. And finally, while I recognize this is outside the jurisdiction of this committee, I would re be remiss if I not speak about what many of us in the ESOP community view as the biggest obstacle to the formation and expansion of ESOPs. It's the chilling effect of the U.S. Department of Labor, and I'd recognize and like to have a question on that later today. I appreciate the time you've given me today to share my testimony and look forward to your question. Thank you, Mr. Shorman. Ms. Frazier, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Ludic Meyer, and members of the committee. I am Alice P. Frazier, President and CEO of Bank of Charlestown, a community bank serving markets in West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia. Today, I testify on behalf of the Independent Community Bankers of America, where I am Chair of the Policy Development Committee and a member of the Board of Directors. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Employee-owned and cooperative firms are important ownership models that deserve our support as lenders, business advisors, and policymakers. My bank currently lends to two co-op borrowers. Access to capital is critical to the success of small businesses of all ownership types. And in this regard, I will discuss the importance of preserving community bank SBA lending, which comes at zero cost to the taxpayer. An experiment in SBA direct lending in which the agency has a poor track record would jeopardize access to the capital for small businesses. Community banks provide practical, real-world business counseling and networking opportunities, particularly for startups, in a way that can never be matched by SBA. We must not be sidelined in the critical task of creating access to capital. We are committed to working with this committee and the SBA to ensure the 7A program is reaching the smallest borrowers. Community banks account for 66% of 7A loans over the past 10 years, and my bank has been an SBA lender for over 40 years. The median loan size in our SBA portfolio is just under $100,000. We recently hired three highly experienced SBA lenders to place more of an emphasis on this product. The Community Bank Small Business Partnership goes well beyond a loan. My bank is currently working with an African-American entrepreneur who has corporate experience, but no experience in setting up a company. He lacks contacts with accountants and lawyers and other professionals that specialize in startups. And unfortunately, as he has told me, African-American entrepreneurs are often disadvantaged in this sense. Mentorship is especially needed in minority business communities. As we talked about his business plan, he asked for these connections, in which we were happy to provide. We spent time walking him through different types of loans, eventually settling on a 7A line of credit, which we expect to grow quickly as his business ramps up. The loan is really just one feature of a much broader partnership. Our experience in working with other small businesses gives us a unique ability to provide insights and counseling. I provide other examples of our small business relationships in my written statement. Informed guidance, education, and borrower confidence building is our core value proposition. We stand by our partners and continue to provide guidance as the business grows and new opportunities arise or as they encounter setbacks and challenges. I do not believe that the SBA direct lending could offer any remote substitute for a long-term relationship with a community bank. Employee ownership and cooperative ownership are models that make sense for many firms. 
Community banks support these firms, bringing the same commitment that they bring to any small business relationship. And I discuss my cooperative lending in my written statement. We are willing to discuss alternative solutions to better accommodate co-ops and employee-owned firms. However, we caution against a broad waiver of guarantee requirement on all 7A loans. SBA lending is not, direct lending is not the answer to capital access for small businesses of any ownership model. This experiment has been tried and failed, resulting in subsidy rates of 10 to 15 times higher than in loan guarantee programs, as noted in a recent Congressional Research Service report. What's more, as a locally based lender, we're able to root out fraud to which direct lending would surely be vulnerable. I urge this committee to reconsider the direct lending provisions included in the Build Back Better Act. I thank you again for this opportunity to offer my perspective, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Frazier, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, in June of this year, I formed the Stakeholder Capitalism Caucus with Representative Dean Phillips, who also sits here with me on the House Small Business Committee and who also shares an entrepreneurial background. We created the Stakeholder Capitalism Caucus in the wake of COVID-19's pandemic to engage Congress and business leaders on ways to reimagine the role of corporations to equitably benefit stakeholders and to lead to a more sustainable and prosperous economy. With their unique business structures, ESOPs and cooperatives have demonstrated that employee-owned business models can produce higher wages and can promote job preservation for their workers during periods of economic distress, as well as invest more in their local communities than conventionally owned businesses can. While conventionally owned businesses may have outside stakeholders, the stakeholders of employee-owned businesses are in fact the workers themselves. I would like to know if any of the panelists can address the ways in which your business models lend themselves to more equitable and sustainable conditions for your workers, as well as invest in your respective local communities in line with the ideals of stakeholder capitalism. And if it's okay, I'd like to start with Mr. Shor Shorman on that. Hey, I, I like that question and, and frankly, good to see you again. Uh, when, you, when you take a look at what we do in our local communities, how important it is to have that connectivity in local communities. That's what we do with our radio stations. That's what we do with our, our businesses is help them grow. And so when you ask that of being able to uh, talk about that and over the last pandemic, that's the one that comes to mind. Uh, our ESOP, we did not lay off anyone. We did not furlough anyone. We kept everyone engaged. We saw, fought the same battles as everyone, of dealing with the uh, pandemic and, and being able to keep people at work and, and move them to the right place. But the employee ownership model adds a powerful advantage to local community business because it keeps things local. It keeps that business local. It keeps those who are the employee owners right in the middle of, of working to grow and working together to win for that company. And we've seen that in results of not only of working our way out of the pandemic, but working during the pandemic of not having to do any layoffs or furloughs. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Cooper, would you have anything to contribute as well to that question? And hello to Philly. <laughs> Hello. I, uh, you know, I want to make sure I understood it was a two part question, correct? And that the you asked about the contributions to the community, but also how we have kind of hung in there. Is that correct? No, I'm largely asking kind of what are the benefits do you perceive of co ops and in ESOPs uh, to making sure that you're not only helping uh, your, your shareholders, in many many cases, yeah. co-ops and ESOPs, the shareholders are the people, but also the community at large, uh, potentially the environment, uh, investors, all those kinds of things as well. Well, for us, I mean, clearly we are a home care business. So we are serving uh, residents of the Philadelphia area every day by providing direct care. The one thing I wanted to say, which answers the question um, as we were wrapping up is that during this uh, pandemic, with all the challenges that we face in this industry, um, the advantage that we have as a cooperative is that, you know, our worker owners are not only committed to quality, um, but they're committed to their consumers. They're here 
because they want to be. We know that worker owners stay longer. Um, they work harder. Um, they're far more committed to their consumers, decreasing um, the revolving door of direct care workers going in and out, um, ensuring that their consumers are safe and making sure that um, they understand that they're representing the company that they are going to benefit from both financially and um, in terms of having uh, say in the direction of the company. So we feel as a cooperative that that is our advantage in this industry, that because our workers are owners, they are more likely to stay, more likely to deliver quality care, more likely to contribute positively to the community by way of reducing um, hospital readmittances, accidents, incidents, and preventing illnesses. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. And lastly, for Mr. Storman again, what can we be doing more to promote businesses to transition to employee ownership? And many of you talked about the silver tsunami. Many people are trying to figure out what their transition, you know, exit strategies look like in this economy uh, because people are aging out of it, amongst other reasons. Is What can we be doing to improve uh, improve uh, the idea ideals of ESOPs and co-ops uh, in the common vernacular? Well, this committee, committee is doing great work. Uh, we see that every day because we're on the streets working. With I'm afraid kids. that I need to stop you, sir, because I ran out of time and I, I need to uh, go ahead and yield. My time has now expired. The ranking member, Mr. Luke Demeyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Frazier, thank you for joining us again today, and I want to start with uh, with you. Um, appreciate your testimony today. Um, like you, I'm very concerned about the recent trends in SBA toward direct lending. Um, you know, we're currently witnessing the devastation of direct lending through SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and according to SBA's own Inspector General, the program has a potential fraud rate of nearly 30 percent. Unbelievable. And you rightly point out in your testimony, both in your written and verbal testimony, about the Congressional Research Service report that indicated that SBA in the late 90s stopped issuing direct lending, uh, stopped issuing yeah, direct business loans because the subsidy rate was 10 to 15 times higher than the subsidy rate for its loan guarantee program, which means that it was losing 10 to 15 times more money in direct lending than it was the loan guarantee program, which means it does nothing. Has no idea what it's doing when it comes to direct lending. Um, your comment in there is, is it talks about your your uh, pointing to an example of where the bank actually caught somebody with an idle loan uh, fraud a attempt and caught them. So I just appreciate you expanding on that a little bit more. This is a really really big concern to me whenever we see that, that they're trying to actually propose more direct lending for programs and empower the SBA even more whenever they can't handle what they got right now. Thank you for that question, and, and happy to expand on that. Um, I might begin with, as a new banker, anyone that joins, the first thing they train you in preventing a bank robbery is look someone in the eye. And so um, there's a, a big value to that when you're getting ready to lend someone money. And, and if you are applying for a loan through a portal or um, through a, an, an opportunity where you really don't have to look anyone in the eye, the fraud is, is opportunity. So to be able to visit a bank or visit a business and talk and speak with the owners of the business, understand their dream and what they're doing, and really be able to evaluate how effective they are helps evaluate the opportunity for the loan to be um, used well, successful, and, and in play. So I think recently what we did experience, we had read about the fraud alert SBA had issued on their website related to idle loans where they had um, distributed the money and typically a borrower would come in and ask for all of the money in cash. We share that with our branch <clears throat> managers and one of them happened to have an instance where uh, someone had come in and opened an account about 60 days prior and had not really had any transactions in the account, very little for which would have been deemed a business account by far had gotten two idle loan deposits two days apart and within four days came in wanting to take out what was equal to $20,000 out of the bank in cash. Now, of course, we had shared that information. Our branch manager, rightly so, had reached out to operations. Ultimately, we returned that money because it was deemed not appropriate. Um, at that time. So I, I, the fraud is there, um, and so I liken it back to being able to look at folks. You know, as, we, as we've gone through this problem, <clears throat> the Inspector General has pointed it out, or SBA's own Inspector General has pointed it out, and 
indicates to us that he's trying to put in place some uh, changes to the program to make it work better. SBA acknowledges that they're trying to put some place, things in, in place. But by the, by, in, in the next breath, IG uh, 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 Inspector General sits there and says, well, yeah, they're in, the, the changes are in place, but the employees don't follow the procedures. The employees don't follow the recommended changes, and as a result, the same thing's happening. Have you experienced that, that they ignore the processes, or are you, maybe you may not even be aware of the changes SBA has to go through to, to make this work, but just a comment from you. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I could really speak effectively directly on that because I'm not aware of the changes or how they operate internally, <coughs> um, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's interesting. And to me, the, the template for how this can actually work is the PPP program, the standpoint that the banks who have a know your customer uh, law in place uh, and actually, as you said, have to look the customer in the eye, uh, make sure that those folks are who they say they are and that they're a real business, a real person, uh, their, their address and phone numbers and their signatures and social security number, all that balance, all that, that matches up, where when you do this uh, virtually, it, there's a lot of this doesn't take place. So to me, I'd, I'd like for you to just elaborate just a little bit in my last 20 seconds here. You know, even through the PPP process <coughs> for loans that we, loan requests we received through our online portal, we would take the time to either visit their place of business, make sure we reached out and contacted them, had ways to validate it beyond just a complete virtual experience. And I, I think that puts us at a lot of risk if everything is virtual. Appreciate your comments this morning. And I think that uh, we actually have a template in place that shows how we can fix the problems at SBA. We just have to make sure we do it right. Thank you very much for your testimony. The gentleman's time has expired and the gentleman yields back. The gentleman, Representative Dean Phillips, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations and Regulations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and greetings to our witnesses and colleagues. Uh, my great-grandfather, Jay Phillips, uh, started as a newspaper boy in Manitowoc, Wisconsin in uh, 1912 and created a business that became very successful over many years. He used to tell me that owners act differently than employees. They reuse paper clips and they turn off the lights when they leave the office. And he believed that business was a means to an end and the end wasn't accumulating as much capital and wealth as possible, rather sharing as much as possible. Uh, and in 1941, he created the Phillips Bonus and Profit Sharing Plan, a copy of which I have here in my hand. And he wrote in it, Unfortunately, the great majority of the people in this country never achieve the degree of financial independence which permits them to live out their lives without the help from others. I believed, and still do, that the time to help people solve this problem is during the prime of their life and not when they become objects of charity. Uh, when he introduced this plan in 1941, the top 1% of Americans controlled about 30% of wealth in America. Eighty years later, that number is 40% and growing. I think we can all agree, Democrats and Republicans, that ownership uh, is the best example, broad ownership uh, in capitalism. We do not need a revolution in capitalism, rather evolution. And in my estimation, that's employee stock ownership programs. So my question, uh, starting with you, Ms. Cooper, is you know, why are there not more ESOPs in America? And what can we here in Congress do uh, to incentivize and encourage and promote uh, and hopefully see national benefits from employees owning more businesses in America? You know, I don't know if I can answer why there aren't more in the country, but I can tell you that, you know, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, we work to the same way Cooperative Home Care Associates supported us in um, replicating that model. We are supporting others and replicating the model and trying to, in healthcare, you know, really make the connection between uh, ownership and quality of care. We know that um, in this country, we're having an issue with um, delivering care. You know, we talk about the silver tsunami and the number of people that, you know, are still living independently, but may need some assistance and are beginning to need some assistance in how there aren't just enough people out there. One of the things that we worry about the most in this industry is fraud and abuse and neglect. Well, we know that when someone is an owner, um, they take a lot of pride in the level of care that they're delivering, um, and they take the work you know, very seriously. They understand how important it is um, to make sure quality is delivered and to protect those from fraud, neglect, and abuse. And, 
this is something that all of our workers have in common and they buy into. And I think it's necessary in order to create opportunities for uh, quality care, continuity of care, um, and to protect our seniors and people living with disabilities. In healthcare, to me, it makes sense that a cooperative um, or a worker-owned model uh, contributes to solving the problem in numerous ways, not just in you know, the delivery of quality care and the um, what ownership means as they are delivering quality care, but also in the ability to um, participate in a culture where you then contribute to the direction of the company and can talk about what it means to have a quality job and how those two are connected. Thank so for us, it's about uh, Ms. Cooper, I'm going to just in the spirit of uh, allowing a couple others to speak to, if, if I might just move to Mr. Condra uh, for comments on what we might do here in Congress uh, to promote uh, employee ownership uh, uh, across the nation. Thank you. The number one issue is access to capital. It's, it's if you go to a conference, if you talk to uh, cooperative developers, it is need access to capital. Uh, the USDA has a business and industry program that does not require this personal guarantee blockage for cooperatives. If they were able to make loans to uh, businesses outside of or outside of rural areas and urban areas, we wouldn't be here today. But unfortunately, they can only make loans to rural areas, and the SBA continues to, to block access to capital to cooperatives. And the fact is, for banks to do startups, we need we need credit enhancements. We need the the uh, the seven day guarantee type of guarantee to continue to grow these businesses. All right, appreciate it. Uh, I just have ten seconds left to just to inspire my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, to pursue what should be very unifying, uh, which is to expand ownership in the United States. Uh, as we try to uh, inspire compassionate capitalism. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman, Representative Roger Williams, the vice ranking member of the committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank all the witnesses for joining us today. And in full disclosure, I'm a small business owner myself for 51 years, and I haven't had a day in my life in 51 years I haven't owed a community bank money. And they're very important to me. And I want to also say to the bankers, uh, congratulations on the way you handled the PPP. It was, uh, was well done. Uh, in the last year and a half, we've observed how community financial institutions are better equipped to handle small business lending than the federal government. In the early days of the pandemic, the private sector was deputized to help deliver business serving loans quickly to American small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program. They were a leading force and successfully e executed one of the most successful emergency lending programs in our country's history. And on the contrary, the SBA is rolled out of the Shuttered Venues Operation Grant Program, or SVOG, took over seven months before they delivered their first dollars and was inefficient and lacked transparency. So nonetheless, Democrats are still proposing a direct lending option under the SBA's 7A loan program that will cut off the private sector financial institution's role. And they're the ones that give service. And to meet the immediate needs of our community small businesses, we need to get the private sector more involved, not less. So, Ms. Frazier, can you speak more on how cutting the private sector's lending role from the 7A loan program, like Democrats have proposed, would have affected community banks and small businesses alike? Thank you for that question. You know, uh, business lending is just not as simple as it is with consumer lending. There's a lot of nuances to business lending that you have to take in consideration. It's what is the business model? How is the financial reporting? What, what is the leader like? Are they going to be successful? Do they have a plan that can work, the location, et cetera? All of these things play in the factor of making a decision on a loan, not just completing an application and, and submitting financial information. And oftentimes, the financial information, you need to talk with the business owner to understand what's there. So without that sort of relationship building and understanding, that goes on in a community bank with the small businesses, I'm concerned that the direct lending would really not be as effective as it could be for that. And, and, and with the story that I shared, oftentimes the small businesses, the entrepreneurs, they don't understand the different types of loans that they can use to help their business grow or the purpose of them. And, and direct lending might limit that opportunity or probably will limit that opportunity overall. A relationship with your banker is much better than a relationship with the government. And Most would say yes. <laughs> uh, community banks are an integral part of the Main Street America. 
They provide access to capital and financial services. I've said they have me for 51 years with personalized relationships to the small business they serve. The government must not impose excessive regulations on banks that will make them less competitive and less struggling to compete with larger financial institutions. Small businesses uh, depend on community banks for their knowledge around the needs of local communities, and this direct relationship better positions community and regional banks to assist small business and reinvest local dollars back in the communities that they are part of to create more jobs. So, Ms. Fraser, how are small businesses affected when a local community bank closes, and how can Congress uh, ensure that community financial institutions can remain competitive against their larger multinational counterparts? Thank you. That, I, I'm, for recognizing how communities are affected when community banks are closed or are faced with challenges that, that prevent them from staying independent and involved in the community. Oftentimes, what exits first is the co um, community dollars that are um, invested in the local nonprofits, the different civic organizations, et cetera, that really need the involvement of the community banks overall. But then talk about the small businesses, those relationships that we build, um, we invest in, we help the businesses network with each other because we know we have the conversations with each and we know what someone's looking for and who can help solve that problem for them. So the, I, I believe what you can do is continue to keep us involved in programs like the SBA, collaborate with us so that we can make those guidelines easier for people to access the capital that's needed to continue to grow. Uh, community banks now know firsthand the importance of Main Street America having access to capital. So I've got little time here. Let me just go right to the question, Ms. Frazier. Small businesses continue to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell me and quickly, in your opinion, what the impact of higher taxes and new costly compliance regulations will be on both small business and the banks? Right now, what we see is our small businesses continue to struggle to find employees to be able to make additional revenues and profits. So if we added additional taxes, I think it would be very harmful. Cutting taxes is always good. For business, Thank you yeah. for your testimony. The gen gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentlewoman, Representative Cherise Davids, chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth and Tax and Capital Access, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman, and thanks to our witnesses for joining us here today. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we're getting the chance to hold this hearing. You know, employee-owned businesses have uh, certainly have an impressive uh, track record of high higher employee retention, uh, pay, and and have definitely proven to be more resilient during uh, economic downturns. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I, I think that this conversation is important. You know, as as these companies um, still might struggle with access to capital, um, even even with the SBA programs. Um, I think it's important for us to to constantly evaluate how we can be uh, helpful, you know, and, and that's why I've supported, um, I have supported legislation like the promotion and expansion of uh, private employee ownership. Um, we got to come, we got we to gotta do a better, better job with our marketing here. Promotion and expansion of private employee ownership act. Um, you know, I think uh, bills like this, um, you know, we're, we're talking about expanding tax incentives, uh, federal assistance for ESOPs uh, to encourage small businesses to, to use this business model. And, um, you know, I was uh, also glad that we got the chance uh, to, um, to put out from this committee uh, our portion of the Build Back Better Act, which would include $500 million for a, a pilot program for cooperatives and, and ESOPs. Uh, to receive SBA loans without a personal or, or entity guarantee. And um, you know, I'm proud to support this kind of legislation because this is the stuff that benefits stability for, um, for companies and, and provides their employees and customers, um, uh, employee owners and customers with, uh, during critical times. Um, you know, we're in, we're in some like very uh, uncertain economic times and um, with that, I, I, I definitely want to make sure to talk to uh, Mr. Shorman, uh, fellow fellow Kansan here. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I was hoping to hear you um, talk a little bit about uh, employee-owned businesses, um, uh, specifically, um, you know, how ESOPs and uh, such have been more resilient during the economic downturn. 
Um, and then, you know, maybe how uh, that correlate, the resiliency maybe correlates with uh, higher retirement savings um, and that sort of thing. Well, first off, uh, I look forward to meeting you in person, Representative Davids, and sometime when we're in Kansas City, be able to meet up and do that. But our company, uh, we started in 98 with our ESOP, and you've seen the growth of wealth for our employee owners. We had that with a recent transaction. We saw that, how that paid off for employee owners as they built the company. And that that's the story. And, and I grew up on a family farm. And you work together to build something. So at the end of the day, everybody has, uh, uh, I guess, a part of the pie and, and the ability to really focus on what they want to do. We've seen that in our business. As far as being able to figure out how to make it easy for companies to do ESOPs, that's, that's a challenge because you can set up a 401k and you have clear rules for making that happen. Uh, but an ESOP is more complicated in that. And, and what this community is doing to kind of simplify that working for ways to find easier access, looking to your community bank to make that happen. And secondly, being able to uh, get clear regulatory uh, guidance. And that's one of the biggest challenges. The DOL has, has perpetuated an absence of formal regulatory guidance. And so being able to have clear guidance would allow companies to jump in and be able to share that model. Because in local communities, uh, owners, and we see them every day, Owners that are running these smaller businesses don't have a big team of executives that can go to D.C. and do that. But they do have a team of people who can work with the local bank to grow that business. And being able to keep that business local versus selling to another big corporation or something like that is so very important, especially in Kansas. And we have so many of those local business owners that want to transition to something else. We would just like it to be an ESOP. Yeah, I appreciate. Um, I appreciate that, and definitely, um, I'll continue to to figure out ways to be supportive um, from the small business committee, and um, would be open to further conversations about um, how we might work with the uh, Department of Labor, um, you know, to clarify some regulatory uh, the the guidelines. Um, Would appreciate I, that. Thank you. I appreciate um, all of you taking the time to join us, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedorn, Ranking Member Subcommittee on Underserved Agricultural and Rural Business Development. Thank, for thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It's nice of you to hold this hearing. And uh, I'm uh, somebody who's been a pretty strong supporter of employee-owned businesses and co-ops, uh, visited many across our district, talked to a lot of employees who seem to... Uh, appreciate the opportunity to kind of build their own future, uh, you know, grow their own retirement, have some control of it, feel like they're part of it. And it's, uh, it's amazing the millions and millions of Americans who are in the workforce that are, are participating. And so it's, uh, I think, a big success and it's something we should continue to uh, see what we can do to foster and certainly not put any impediments in there. I would ask uh, Mr. Shorman, you, you seem to be a strong advocate. Uh, perhaps you could just uh, let everyone know a, a little bit more about why it's uh, such an opportunity for not just business owners to uh, convert this way, but for the employees. The well, you look at it. You look at it, and thank you. The you look at it from an employee standpoint. You can work for a company your entire career, and at the end of your career, maybe have some sort of four hundred one k or maybe it's government retirement. You work for an employee owned company, and we've seen that happen where the employees have worked for our company 20 years and uh, they end up retiring, but they have a nest egg that they're able to do things that they want to do. You can't do that in a regular company, but as an employee owner, you participate day in, day out in the growth and success of the company. And we see that in the success. And, and that also means that success stays in the local community. And, and our company is based locally. We have to have strong local businesses so to see them being able to transition into an ESOP and take their company, keep it local and share that ownership, that's a powerful way to do business, especially in small markets, small communities across our country. And it's just, a, it's an excellent option. Obviously, nobody has to do it. Uh, people buy into it. And, uh, and the employees, uh, like, like I said, that I've spoken with, been very, very pleased. Um, Ms. Frazier. So I think uh, this, this committee is very... Very fortunate to have somebody like our ranking member, Mr. Lukmar, who has a background in, in community banking 
And he brings up some very good points. I mean, if we're if you know, SBA wants to take some of these things over and expand their portfolio, boy, there's been some problems there. A lot of waste, fraud, and abuse, as he said. We don't need any more of that. And we need a little bit more customer service. I, I think uh, Congressman Williams hit it right. Uh, who's, who's going to be there for the customer more than the community banker, the people in the community, invested in the community, who already have them as customers, uh, or a big government bureaucracy, or a big uh, uh, corporate bureaucracy? I'm, I'm one Republican, certainly never stands up and advocates for the big banks. I think uh, the community banks have been hit hard. What do you think? Don't you think you're in a much better position to, uh, to deliver those services that maybe than others and do it in a way that's going to protect the taxpayers? Thank you. I completely agree with what you say. Um, we live in the communities we serve. We see our business leaders at church. We see them in the grocery stores. We see them out shopping at the soccer games, et cetera. So we, we are involved in that and the community with them side by side. It's just not a faceless application. It's just not a faceless business. We know when their businesses are thriving and we know when they're struggling and we do what we can to help. So I, I think community banks, are, are the partners and, and really what help make communities thrive. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the majority wants to take a bunch of money that's uh, created by capitalism, and I would say capitalism is, is always compassionate because without uh, producing wealth, you have no, no wealth in order to help people. So, um, and I want to take a bunch of money and say, look, we're going to help you here. But what they, they fail to talk about is how the other part of their bill is going to raise taxes and how their other agenda is going to increase regulations. And how part of the, both agendas, both in this bill and across the board, is going to drive up the cost of energy needlessly and make it less reliable. And lastly, who knows about trade? We haven't seen much from the administration on that. And then fiscal policy, we see what's going on with inflation. It's just going to be spurred more. You know, um, those things, those good government or bad government policies, are way more important than government handing out money in order to have capital in this case. You can destroy businesses. You can give them all the money in the world, but if you're going to have policies that will destroy them, what difference does it make? And I think a lot of, a lot of businesses across our country need to, need to reflect on this, and a lot of employees, that we're at a crossroads. And a lot of these policies that are coming out of Washington on the other side stand to destroy them and put them out of business forever. Businesses have been around for generations. So uh, while I appreciate uh, the need for capital and we'll do what we can in order to help people, I do not appreciate the philosophy and the policies of the, Dem the Democrat Party overall in this bill. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and now I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Condra, uh, the USDA Business and Industry Loan Program does not require a personal guarantee from cooperatives. Instead, USDA requires co-op members to sign a covenant to withhold profit distribution until the agency loan is paid in full. Could this work for the SBA loans to co-ops in place of a personal guarantee? This could this could work, and this could work. And also, if if we sat in a room, we could think of all kinds of alternative ideas that the Main Street Act encouraged SBA to do. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Fraser. The number of seven A loans made under 150,000 decreased by 44% over the past decade. The decline is even more troubling for 7A loans below 50,000, which decreased by 59% over the last five years. The average seven loan size has also more than double in that time. In FY, 2012, it was just over 340,000. As of September 17, the average loan size this fiscal year is over 600, 687,000. Many people will say smaller loans, those under 150,000, are not profitable. So traditional uh, lenders are not making those loans. So why don't you say? to small businesses who are seeking loans of under 150000 What do you say to them? 
Thank you, and, and there's no way we can refute the numbers. I can only share with you my experience working with our customers. I, um, oftentimes what we see is the expenses of starting a business are higher today than they were maybe two, three, four years ago. And so the loans that we have done to help startups, either a tenant upfit, um, more, and I'm, in my testimony I talk about a baseball coaching facility where we helped them upfit a tenant facility, and it's really nothing more than a warehouse, and they've got some nets, but the cost of doing so is yes. expensive. Ms. Ms. Fraser, mm -hmm. you know, one of our commitment is to make sure that small businesses have access to affordable capital. And when you look at the overall portfolio of loans that have been made, the numbers speak for themselves. So we need to look at alternative, alternative options of affordable loans, and this is one of them. So it has worked for USDA. I do not understand why it cannot work here. So Mr. Condra, the small business title of the Build Back Better Act, which was approved by this committee in early September, provided $500 million for a cooperative lending pilot that will waive SBA personal or entity guarantee for co-ops. Will this new pilot program improve co-ops access to 7A loans? Absolutely. And, and what a great uh, compromise uh, with this committee, with Congress and the SBA and the private sector. Uh, as you know, we, we continue to discuss and work with SBA on these issues, but they just will not budge on the requirements, even though we provide examples after examples of why it's not working. An example, like in my testimony, uh, the, the pastor raised $7 million. Apparently, that's not enough money to secure an SBA loan uh, that they still require him to, I guess, would to to use his used car as collateral over $7 million. So it will completely open up the gates for this industry, mm -hmm. uh, for the food grocery industry and the worker co-op industry. Thank you. Mr. Sherman, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act allows 7A preferred lenders to process ESOP loans under their delegated authority to streamline the process for small firms. Unfortunately, SBA's rule implementing the law says that those loans cannot be processed under delegated authority. How did the ESOP community respond to SBA position, which contradicts the clear language of the statute? Well, I think this committee has it right. I mean, it, trying to get uh, the, the direct contact with local community bankers is, is it's not a shortcut, but it's a way to get something done that's not happening today. So the committee is right on, right on target with what they're doing. And I think more of what we're talking about today is just say, hey, this is what has to be done. ESOP should be eligible for SBA loans through the local lending authority. Thank you. My time has expired. And now we recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just have a few comments. Uh, you know, an employee stock ownership plan and ESOP is a wonderful uh, employment structure for a small business. ESOPs allow their workers the ability to obtain ownership in the company where they are employed, uh, really complementing the way small businesses normally operate. With over 6,500 ESOP companies nationwide, I am proud to say that over 250 of them are in my great state of Minnesota. With that being said, I am worried about ESOPs and how they might fare under this administration's tax plan, specifically under the proposed capital gains tax increase. When ESOPs distribute actual shares of company stock, rather than pay out the value of the shares in cash, the employees pays income tax at ordinary tax rates on the value of company contributions to the plan, plus capital gains tax on appreciation and share value when they choose to sell the shares. We can sit here and talk all day about the access to capital, but it seems to me that none of it will make a difference if on the back end, in individual employees are stuck paying higher taxes. A capital gains tax increases severely dim diminishes the incentives that normally draw individuals into ESOPs. When they look at getting into or potentially getting into an ESOP and they find uh, that they're going to be paying more taxes, that's a disincentive. 
we have to encourage entrepreneurship and encourage people to invest in their companies and become uh, part of the ESOPs. Despite this administration's claims, this current reconciliation bill will cost something. It will cost the livelihood of small business owners. It will hurt the middle class with tax hikes, hikes and increase the taxes on middle income ESOP participants. We can do better by allowing our small businesses and those particip participating in ESOPs to keep more of their hard-earned money. And Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, first I'd like to welcome Ms. Cooper, and I'm very happy uh, to have the president of the woman-owned work cooperative located in my district on this panel. But I'm also proud of this committee and the chairwoman's work to mark up and pass out of committee 25 billion to help entrepreneurs and the building back better. This includes 500 million for a pilot program for workers and consumer cooperative. This will provide loan guarantees to eligible small business cooperatives for activities including short and long-term working capital. Ms. Cooper, how would this pilot program help Homewood Care and its workers? So currently, you know, we were able, as I mentioned, to get the money we needed for startup, but currently we are really struggling to expand our services. And in this current environment with, you know, the pandemic and us not being eligible for the second, the uh, not having been eligible for the second round of PPP, a loan from the Small Business Administration would help us to expand our services, um, keep our employees employed, but also survive some of the um, changes that are going on in this particular industry. So, you know, right now we are clawing to, um, you know, stay alive in this industry. We know that there are changes that we need to make in order to remain competitive. Um, so yeah, it would help us to continue to stay in business. It would help us to secure our future, to increase volume, to sustain jobs. One, one last question, Ms. Cabo, I want to ask. Um, what's, what's your secret of, of, <laughs> of, of, of bringing this together? I know it's difficult, it's been a very difficult time, but I'm interested in personal aspect of, of secret and pulling things together. You know, you driving to do this. You know, my, <laughs> I'll try not to be, too, I'm a talker. I'll try not to be too long-winded, but my uh, DC statement in college was the working poor. And I'm very much committed to people who go to work every day, who work hard to care for others, who fill a gap that is desperately needed to fill, who um, are still struggling to make ends meet. So for us, that is what drives me, um, my commitment to them. And I know, you know how important the work is that they're doing, but also the pride that they have in being owners. Um, the secret is that, that the worker ownership model creates a culture in which people are proud to be here, proud to do the work that they do. Um, we are fully transparent as it comes to financials and every other aspect of the business. The board is primarily direct care workers. So, you know, the secret really is the culture. The secret is the cooperative. The secret is, is the fact that when we send someone to someone's home, they can say, I am the owner of the company and I'm going to make sure that you get the quality care that you deserve. I thank you, Ms. Cooper. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And now we recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Ranking member and subcommittee on economic growth, tax, and capital access. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's an interesting hearing. Uh, we certainly all want responsible, reasonable, um, reasonable risk, that is, access to capital available to new entrepreneurs, current businesses, uh, those businesses that are simply trying to grow and expand. And you know what, especially in some areas where we need it most. I have many very stressed cities in my district that 
I'd love to see them have better um, access to capital, of course, more, more efficient and accessible. Um, now, the cooperative formula that exists with the community banks and the SBA can definitely be improved. But as we saw with the PPP versus the idle, they were quite different, right, in the, in the outcomes. One had, one was effective, one was unbelievably useful, one, uh, you, you can't even go anywhere in a chamber meeting without uh, those saying, hey, thank you for that PPP, it, it was everything to us. And then the idle, which was strictly run by the SBA, and I, I, I appreciate the SBA, they were very helpful to us uh, during uh, the, the crisis and all, uh, but it was high levels of fraud, right? So that, that's a clear sign that that's not likely the best formula. The, 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 the cooperative between the community banks and the SBA uh, shows to be a better formula. Now it can be improved, right? I mean, um, you know, the, the, the whole PG requirement, the uh, personal guarantee uh, being mandatory as opposed to maybe only being uh, needed when, when uh, assets and collateral don't, don't stack up for the, uh, for the loan to be made. It can be definitely made more efficient, as uh, Ms. Frazier and I were speaking about earlier. Uh, but without the cooperative effort, we can see this real, real s serious fraud, okay? And this isn't just fraud from some large stockholders. This is the taxpayers, and it's our responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. And some of the conversation going here, uh, it, 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 we're, we're going to open ourselves up to that. Uh, now, if you don't have a, a, a personal guarantee or a PG, there's a likelihood, right, how the economy works, that the that the uh, competitive interest rates uh, may, may be higher, more collateral requirements, perhaps less loans, right? So there's some un unintended consequences that, that can come with that. But that, that can be reviewed and be, be worked out as hap happens. Um, but why the leadership of the Biden administration uh, for SBA seems to want to centralize the authority within the SBA is something, frankly, we should be, be very wary of. Uh, you know, just quickly on the ESOP idea, you know, I know many businesses that were ESOP. Some did well, some did terrible. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's a big payday for, for the owners, by the way. Uh, and, and then loans are made. And if that doesn't work out, there's a lot of false hope and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, wishes and dreams can, can tumble down pretty fast. So every business has to do what's, what's best for itself, what's in its interests. Many companies have options. Many companies have partial ESOPs. Many companies have um, stock ownership plans, right, and good, good retirement plans. So now why would those companies be, be not receive the same level of, of, of SBA uh, 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 resources and plans that, that, that an ESOP would receive? So I got a, a problem there. So, Ms. Frazier, let me ask you then, uh, related to the PPP, uh, ver do, you, do you believe that that went relatively uh, efficient? And as well, if it weren't with your over, some, of, some of the community bank's oversight and um, uh, uh, credit criteria uh, understanding and knowledge of many of the customers, of course, how how much different would it have been than the than what we we've seen occur? Thank you for that question, boy. That that would uh, a lot of speculation that it would be largely very different. But I do believe the community banks were able to step up and really address the concerns of the small business borrowers and address their needs and work hand in hand with them to get to it. I. I suspect um, if that program, too, had been a direct type of program, it might not have been enacted as quickly and efficiently. The dollars may not have been uh, able to be distributed to the small businesses as quickly and they're being able to survive um, because it took a lot of hands and a lot of um, dedication and commitment to make that work quick. I agree. We can't put billions of dollars of taxpayer money at risk, so I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. Mr. Carter, you're muted. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Greatly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Shoreman, in my district, a large number of small business owners are first generation business owners, women and are black. With the additional struggles facing these communities in accessing and maintaining capital, how do we make sure that we know uh, about ESOPs and other opportunities that employee-owned business models uh, have as an option? I think one of the, the things we, we talked earlier is that's one of the directives uh, in the act is to be able to make sure education is out there. Everybody knows you can sell to an outsider, you can transfer to your family, or you can just go out of business. But being able to have that fourth option of transferring the business to your employees is so important to be able to tell that story. And, and if we can do that through uh, the resources, uh, whether it be through the SBA and training them to say, here is another option for you, uh, that just makes so much sense. And, and too many times I talk to employers who are in fact, one was in my office the other day looking to transition their company. The ESOP was something completely foreign to them. And so I tell the story about what's going on. We need to do that more and more. We need to put that story on steroids because those 2.5 million uh, tsunami uh, out there who are transitioning their business need another option. And employee ownership is one of them. So what more can be done to raise awareness about the benefits regarding ESOPs? and other employee-owned business models. Um, we know they're there, many people don't know. What can we be doing on our end, uh, specifically to educate minority and women-owned businesses, in your estimation? Well, when somebody comes in, make sure the SBA understands the importance and the value of that as well. And that goes through th training programs for SBA employees that are in the field. That goes to making sure that the ease and access to the system is there which you're working on to be able to find ways for employee-owned companies to access the SBA. And then that local community banker that's sitting over there. And I appreciate the comments earlier and of how that local community banker is connected to the community. And while the person who is selling the business has a legacy there, that local community banker knows who's involved and knows who's a part of that company that that can happen on a national level in Washington, D.C. It can happen if the SBA is, is required to allow and, and look at loans from employee-owned companies and helping them set that up as well. Mr. Sherman, I understand that Eagle Communications began the ESOP conversion process in 1998, became majority owned by employees in 2002, and 100% employees owned in 2012. In your experience with ESOP conversions, what is the biggest obstacle uh, you've seen your companies struggle to overcome in converting to an ESOP? Well, the biggest struggle is out there is making sure there's clarity of regulations. And the DOL has, has really been, uh, has really not put out clear guidance for that. And so when we went through the process, we involved uh, the best professionals so that we were doing it right to get the job done. But we're a bigger company. And uh, at one point, we had 400 employee owners. We now have just under 200. And when you take that, you have to have a clarity of regulation so that even smallest companies can understand what they need to do to set up an employee-owned company and make that happen without worrying about regulatory issues that may come and, and haunt them later on. We need clarity through the DOL to make that happen. We need to have a good path for uh, economic value to be able to get loans through the SBA and then have that resource of tools so that there's educational tools like the ESOP Association to be able to help them get through the process and manage that and then have a successful ESOP. Because that's the goal, to have successful companies that stay local and build their local communities. And, and finally, as my time winds down, if there, were one, if there was one thing that you could ask of this committee, that would aid other small businesses out there that have not, uh, that either don't know about ESOPs, have not had the opportunity to utilize ESOPs, or what could we do as this committee to make your life and any other small business owners um, better or easier to access these resources? Well, I think this committee can, in, in very specific terms, say that ESOP loans are available through the SBA because that would trigger a whole new effect. Right now, that's not an option. Uh, I had a PPP loan, it worked great, and our local banker did it. The local banker can do the same thing with other local businesses there to be able to take and make that money available so that ESOP can be created. But somehow it gets lost in the translation from the committee to the SBA. So say, this is what we wanna have happen and get it done. 
Thank you. Uh, are you back? The gentleman yields back. And now uh, the gentle lady from New York, Ms. Tenney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Velasquez and Ranking Member Lukemeyer, and for holding this meeting. It's of great interest to me as a small business owner. Uh, our company is celebrating our 75th year in business this year. Uh, but let's talk about a little bit of reality today. A lot of capital is uh, that is investment capital is is highly concentrated by geography, tend to be centered around big big business hubs, urban areas like Boston, New York City, San Francisco and leaves behind much of the country, including my fairly rural and suburban district. It also tends to flow disproportionately into high tech industries and not into the manufacturing sector uh, that are more capital intensive, obviously uh, great for creating jobs too, because they're more labor intensive, a lot more diversity in providing labor across all sectors. And, um, and those tend to be really beneficial in my community where the industrial revolution was founded. Uh, but in the absence of these opportunities in these rural areas, and particularly in our areas, many have, been, many have been forced to shut down, partly due to lack of capital and also due to what's happened last year in upstate New York. Um, my solution is to uh, invite, invite all of you to co-sponsor, and some of you have, I appreciate, the American Innovation uh, and Manufacturing Act. This bipartisan legislation will allow the federal government to work with pro the private sector ins to ensure these underserved areas and especially manufacturers who create things uh, are not left behind by today's unequal landscape. Um, also, it does not, um, it does so with strong safeguards. We put a lot of safeguards in place by protecting taxpayer funds. And I think with this type of innovation, we can bring back good middle-class careers um, and by bringing good paying jobs across all sectors. And I wanted to point to one thing. I wanted to ask Ms. Frazier a question. But when we get to this direct lending and creating, uh, you know, and we're all for ESOPs and, and you know, employee-owned businesses, that's a great option. And to opening up the lending process. Um, something in Ms. Uh, Frazier's uh, testimony really struck my eye. And while we try to give more direct lending authority to the SBA, uh, she says in her testimony, uh, while the SBA has the authority to make direct loans, uh, the exception, uh, disaster loans and microloan program intermediaries, it has not exercised this authority since 1998. The SBA indicated that it stopped issuing direct business loans primarily because the subsidy rate was 10 to 15 times higher than the subsidy rate for its loan guarantee programs. And I can tell you as a small business owner, there is nothing worse than killing entrepreneurship, innovation and growth in industry than providing government subsidies and picking winners and losers over other in the marketplace. And I've been the victim of having competitors in the marketplace with government subsidies. And we've been lucky to survive in some cases, but many businesses cannot uh, afford this unfair uh, advantage. And so I wanted to direct my first question uh, to Ms. Frazier. Um, and you, I, I referenced this as well, but let me, if you could just tell me a little bit about 7A loans, and um, tell us a bit about your business plan and how to properly use a bank loan to fund their business. Um, you also guide them through funding and options. Do you think uh, that this partnership with a local bank or investment partner provides an irreplaceable uh, value to a business and increases its potential for success? I know you're gonna say yes, but I want you to give, you, give me some more reasons why, because if it were for small community banks, we wouldn't even be in business today. And uh, thank you for your great testimony. I think it's really important. And if you could address real quickly what the, the subsidy issue that I referenced in your testimony, that'd be great and just clarify that. Thank you. Um, maybe I can start a little bit with, with the stories about how we help people and how we engage with uh, the borrowers or the potential business borrowers. We spend time with them in, in really figuring out what do they need. Because oftentimes, as I mentioned, they think they need a term loan, something that's paid out over five years, but maybe they need short-term working capital. Or maybe they need to buy equipment and they don't know how to pay for it or they don't know how much they can afford to repay. So the time our bankers spend with those businesses really educating towards what the options are and then in sharing with them how maybe as they're starting up, they don't have 
the Capitol to really go a conventional route and how we can use that with SBA to um, subsidize for them. And through PPP, and actually we've been in an existence for 150 years, so serving the rural communities uh, has been very important to us. What we found is, is there is a great need for the 7A programs out in the communities, and we felt it was our responsibility to dig in deeper and made those investments. If you think about the 10 to 15 times um, increased subsidy rate, I would suggest um, that if you could, could wrap up, uh, time has expired. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe we can revisit this. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and now we recognize the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, for five minutes. Mr. Shorman, uh, in addition to. Ms. Chu, you're muted. Mr. Shorman, uh, hi. hi. <laughs> In addition to being a member of the Small Business Committee, I sit on the House Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over issues affecting ESOPs. I'm particularly interested in the way the tax code discourages business owners from agreeing to ESOP conversions, and most importantly, how we can fix this. Um, currently, only C corporations can convert to an ESOP. But hardly any small businesses that organize as a corporation choose the C Corp structure. Instead, most will elect to organize as an S Corp because of the significant tax benefits for small businesses. Congress could choose to extend ESOP eligibility to S corporations in order to provide this option to more small businesses. Could you talk about the impact that could have on encouraging more ESOP conversions? Well, it's going to open the door to a lot more ESOPs because as you know, the, and you mentioned the 1042 benefit allows reinvestments of funds received from the sale of an asset without triggering a taxable event at that time. And a large portion of small businesses are sub S. Uh, Congress has made C Corps eligible for that 1042 benefit and S corporations are ineligible. So Congress could greatly incentivize the formation of new ESOPs by extending that same 1042 benefits that are given to C Corps to S corporations. And with many small businesses out there, you know, we talked about those 10 or 2.5 million baby boomers who have to decide what to do with their business. If they're an S corp, uh, changing that and making it available for the 1042 uh, benefit would greatly open the door to a lot more uh, possibility for employee ownership. Thank you. And let me ask you about another issue uh, that owners face when they convert their business to an ESOP. And that is that often they can't meet the requirement to reinvest their proceeds within one year of the transaction. That's because ESOP conversions often take place over the course of many years because owners are paid in seller notes. This has created a situation where owners either miss out on the tax deferral that Congress created to incentivize ESOP conversions or they purchase 1042 securities that ultimately lose money but have a very, very long maturity. So can yeah, that, you talk talk about how this 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 one year window to reinvest proceeds impacts owners who decide to convert to an ESOP? Yeah, that happened in our case because we formed our ESOP in '98, but it was 2012 before we could purchase all of that. And so there's that time frame that takes place when an, a seller will actually loan money to the employees to be able to buy out that business. So really, what needs to happen? The law needs to be changed so that the taxable event takes place when the transaction is finished, when it's completed or including full repayment of the seller notes. Otherwise, it's a big penalty for that person who sells that first year who may not even have the proceeds from the sale because that's going to happen over a period of years later. So that's very important to take a look at and make happen. Okay. And then there's the third issue. Um, ESOP conversions are disincentivized because owners are so limited in what products they can reinvest in while keeping their tax deferral incentive. And in fact, uh, that's a big reason why so many owners are pushed into buying 1042 securities, which are complicated, expensive, and could end up costing them more money over the long run. And many small business owners who might contemplate an ESOP conversion are considering their retirement, but they can't use the proceeds to invest in a low cost, stable investment like an index fund. 
So could you, can you explain how allowing owners to invest in mutual funds could make ESOP conversions more attractive? Well, I'm a business owner operator and, and not necessarily a tax accountant, uh, but nonetheless, when you look at it, you know, when you take your 1042 money, you want to have choices to put it into. Right now, those choices are very uh, specific. If you could extend that to be able to do things like mutual funds as a qualified investment, that opens the door for more people to be and feel good about making that transaction, making employee ownership a possibility. And frankly, uh, by doing that, it would just remove another impediment for more employee-owned businesses. Thank you. I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. And now we recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, the ranking member, for putting this on. And uh, thank you to our witnesses. I have a question first for Ms. Frazier. Um, in your testimony, you state that waiving the personal guarantee would reduce access to capital for firms. Why do you believe this is the case? Thank you for that question. I, I think we spoke about uh, waiving the personal guarantee. Oftentimes, that's that's the incentive um, to continue to ensure that payments are um, made and the businesses run effectively to do that. Our, um, as regards to, to co-ops, we understand that those are very nuanced, and so that needs to be looked at differently, and we would like to collaborate for that specifically. Um, but other loans, uh, we are really caution against waiving the personal guarantees. All right, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Shorman, uh, in your testimony, you discuss a lender's delegated authority. You even state that loans could take weeks or months if they weren't processed with delegated authority. Why do you believe delegated authority is so important as opposed to loans being sent to the SBA? Well, Hayes, Kansas is a long way from Washington, D.C. And we'd have to lot, walk around a lot of streets in D.C. for even people to know where Hayes, Kansas is. So for us to apply for a loan that gets processed in Washington, D.C., in one of the big, massive offices there, we know the difference. We've seen that happen time and time again with things that we work on. If I can walk across the street have a good community banker that's interested in keeping us in business, keeping our community growing, and I can tell my story to that local banker, and they in turn are able, if they're able to process a PPP loan as complicated and as quick as that all happened, they ought to be able to process an ESOP loan to be able to keep a company going or allow that transaction to happen within the ESOP community to grow ESOPs. And so having that delegated authority, being able to transfer for ESOPs, just like other businesses, I can't believe our local banker, Ms. Frazier may say something different here, but I can't believe our local banker wants to make loans that aren't going to work, that aren't going to keep that company in business. So to allow them and actually say, go do this versus saying, maybe go do this, go do this and loan money to ESOPs, it can be a game changer for employee ownership for allowing those companies to have an option versus some of the others that aren't so good, but having an option to keep that, that ownership local. I appreciate the answer, Mr. Shorman. Uh, Ms. Frazier, did you, uh, did you wanna uh, respond to that or did you have anything else you wanted to add to that, uh, that uh, his statement or that question? I think uh, there's nothing a local community bank enjoys more than helping business remain successful and operating. Well, absolutely. We have a lot of community banks in New York and uh, I've worked with them in my previous in my law practice, and they were very good and helpful small helping small businesses as well as uh, homeowners uh, and individuals. So uh, I have nothing but respect for uh, community banks. So uh, I don't have any further questions. I yield back, Chairwoman. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentle lady from California, ranking member on the subcommittee on innovation, entrepreneurship, and workforce development, Ms. Kim, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Velasquez, and uh, I would like to thank the witnesses for being with us today. You know, earlier this month, I had the opportunity to visit HDL companies that was located in my uh, district in Brea, California. HDL is a pioneer and leader of auditing operations and revenue solutions for public agencies, and it has around 150 employee owners. 
So I saw firsthand the value that ESOPs bring to our communities. And so I want to recognize how this ESOP structure serves as an important tool for businesses owners that are uh, you know, currently discussing and examining retirement. So in order to encourage this model to be adopted and encourage more employee ownership, I, as discussed already, I agree that we can offer more educational tools and clarity. But um, as we discuss access to capital, um, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Fraser, can you elaborate on how the personal guarantee allows community banks to mitigate credit risks and increase capital for firms? And then, and then can you also discuss how SBA can make it easier for community banks and other lending institutions to provide capital for ESOPs and other employee-owned businesses without waiving the personal guarantee? Thank you. When you think about lending, there's oftentimes a lot of factors that go into it, not only what on a business in particular, how the business is going to repay the debt, but what happens when the business has a stumble or, or things go awry for a period of time? And the banks in a conventional way and SBA in this way also rely on the owner of the business to step in and make adjustments. And having that personal ga guarantee holds them to the line of that. And, and so it's very important. It's a, There's five C's of credit and one of those is character and part of that putting your name on the bottom line of a, a loan saying, I will guarantee it is, is a sign of character. And speaking about, um, I think the more we could collaborate together and discuss not only how can we um, look at the guidelines around the co-ops, but let's look at um, how we can also collaborate even more so to meet the needs of those small businesses and those small loans. Um, collaboration would be important. Thank you for your response. You know, clearly, um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, so uh, we had a lot of discussion today, but clearly uh, banks and credit unions and community banks are much better equipped to service their communities than someone from afar in Washington. And as you stated, Ms. Frazier, uh, direct lending through the SBA is not the answer to expanding access to capital for small businesses or women and minority entrepreneurs. I agree. The federal government does not have a good track record of being responsive, nor having good communications with our constituents. So can you elaborate on how community banks and lending institutions are better prepared to detect and prevent fraud than direct lending programs created, created by the government? Thank you. Uh, first of all, we are in the community, so we know the businesses, we know the business owners, we Oftentimes when new businesses are getting started up and those that are seeking capital that might be um, eligible for an SBA loan, we, we can visit them, we see them. And, and as mentioned earlier, there's nothing like laying eyes on someone as, as you're evaluating their ability to repay and their willingness to repay a loan. So I, I believe um, that value that we bring to the table of being um, feet on the street in the community um, helps prevent fraud in those areas. Thank you. You know, as a quick follow-up, uh, can you talk about how or what do tools like the Know Your Customer and AML compliance bring to the table in preventing and detecting fraud? Certainly the documentation that we research and we bring uh, to the table as far as even following up and making sure that they have a certificate of good standing in the state. All of those tools are pieces to validate that these are a credible business and has been established appropriately. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the, uh, the interaction we had and I yield back my time. The gentle lady yields back and now we recognize the gentle lady from Texas, a ranking member on the Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations and Regulations, Ms. Van Dyne, for Thank five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Velasquez. As this committee has heard countless times, access to capital is essential for small businesses. But I can't help but think that a lot of the initiatives that are being put forward by the Democrat Congress are detrimental to the goals of our nation's small businesses. 
And this includes raising small business income taxes, capping the small business deduction, and raising capital gains and estate taxes. All of this comes while small businesses still can't fill their labor needs and our supply chains remain disrupted. As we proceed with this hearing, it's important to underscore that it's not happening in a vacuum. There are very real harms Texas small businesses will face should the reconciliation package that Democrats are attempting to jam through become law. According to the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Texas businesses will lose $663 billion in investments. Corporate tax hikes will cut wage growth by over 23% for employees. And international tax cuts will reduce full-time employment by 12,000 jobs. This is nothing of the $12,000 reduction in medium family income or the exploding debt the average household will be expected to cover because of federal spending. And finally, I want to reiterate how disappointing it is to watch Secretary Yellen skirt her legal obligations to come before this committee while small businesses in our community continue to fight to keep their doors open. I will continue to ask, but I really hope to see her before this committee very soon. I just have a couple of questions. Um, Ms. Alice Frazier, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I have significant concerns about how direct lending by the SBA. Uh, the SBA's latest effort, IDLE, had a large amount of potential fraud, and the OIG reporting a possible fraud rate of up to 30%. Knowing this, can you tell us what the benefits are by including private lenders in small business loan process, and why do you think this administration is trying to cut private lenders out of the process? Thank you for the question. I'm going to start at the end, and, and I'm not sure that I could answer why I think that they're trying to cut it out of the process, but I would say that having the private lenders, the community banks, banks involved, this is what we've done. We've been doing it for years and years. It's, it's a good process that works today. Um, we work effectively with the SBA, and to change that process today, I'm not sure even the business owners or, the, or those that would utilize it would understand how it would work, and given their current experiences with the program, such as the IDOL, I, I'm not sure they would trust it as well. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, access to capital is crucial, but capital for business owners today isn't going as far as it used to. So prices for goods across the border up. We've seen unprecedented number of cargo ships anchoring offshore of our ports and shuttering of supply chains and this administration is planning to increase taxes on small businesses. So in your view, how do these challenges affect small business? Oh, they are affecting things greatly at this point in time. We have um, multiple co uh, committee-type meetings around in our different local areas where we bring small businesses together, and, and that takes up a good bit of the hour that we spend together, and I think to... Um, elaborate not only the challenges with labor, but the challenges of the supply chain and the fears that they will have increased taxes has great concern for them. So you've talked to a number of, of businesses, I'm sure, over the last year. Do you have any specific examples of how people are either not as successful as they could have been because of some of these policies or ways that they're not currently investing because of threats to these policies? Oh, sure. Um, I can tell you uh, we have landscaping firms that are unable to hire enough people to do the jobs that they have actually been hired to do or contracted with. It might even be um, restaurants that have to close two days a week because they can't hire enough workers to remain open um, and the workers are overworked. Or even in such, the, the cost of the food has gone so great they can't increase their prices enough. Uh, one company that hires a number of workers that work remote said that they hired 200 workers over a nine-month period of time to retain 50. Um, and so I think the... You said they hired 200, 200 workers? To retain 50 in that time period. And it's just the transient nature, the uh, the way that labor is, is working today is, is affected their business greatly. All right, I appreciate that very much. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Thank you again to our witnesses for joining us today. Your stories serve as a testament to the power of employee-owned businesses and all they offer uh, the labor force. If we genuinely want to help the American people build back better, 
we must promote policies to empower American workers. Employee-owned businesses merge ownership and employees' interests, helping to create a symbiotic relationship where everyone thrives. As ESOPs and cooperatives become more prominent, the American workforce will benefit. I will ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so order. And if there is no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.